Hello, this is Matt Luby with the University of Nebraska at the Panhandle Research and Extension Center in Scott's Bluff. Today what I would like to discuss are some nutrition and management related issues that we have when we're receiving feedlot cattle. One of the first considerations that producers should be aware of when they are purchasing cattle that aren't born out of their own cows is the origin of those animals. So a lot of times in the larger feed yards, there's somebody at the feedlot that knows where those animals are coming from, what kind of condition they are in. So we kind of categorize those into different uh, categories of either high risk, moderate risk, or low risk. Obviously, <laughs> the high risk steers or heifers that are coming into a feedlot or backgrounding operation you don't know the origin. They could be on in the truck for a long time. These might be commingled steers that are purchased from a sale barn, and you're unsure if they're castrated, dehorned, or have had their vaccination shot. Moderate risk could be a cow going through a sale barn, but have went through a preconditioning program. Maybe these are also animals that are on the truck for a while, several hours. But you know they aren't as high risk as those that are naive. And obviously, low risk could be those ranch direct animals that went through a preconditioning program and didn't have a long transportation. So when we look at these different types of cattle, what we need to do is feed them and manage them according to that risk. And really, for all animals coming into a new facility or a new feed yard. The first rule is to get them to eat. If we get the correct nutrition in them, uh, we, those calves or those calves have a greater chance of performing well in the feed yard. Uh, I'm not going to talk about different vaccination or receiving animal health protocols. Uh, one of the things I would really encourage producers to do is have a consultation with a veterinarian to decide what program is needed for your particular operation. And that can also tie into the background of those animals, whether they're high, moderate, or low risk. When looking at animals, if you know they're going to come into the yard, if they're preconditioned or not preconditioned, uh, some research has shown that the proportion of cattle that are treated, if they're preconditioned, is lower than if they're not preconditioned. Similarly, death loss is lower, average daily gains are improved, and feed conversion, the pounds of feed needed to put on one pound of body weight gain, is decreased. And that's what we want. We want uh, fewer pounds of feed per pound of gain. So feed efficiency is improved, and animals grading percent choice or higher is also improved. So there's many different data sets that show this, and you know, getting those preconditioned calves in, uh, a lot of times some feed yards or feeders will pay more for those animals because when they get to the yard, they're going to perform quite a bit better. Uh, other research has shown that ranch direct calves compared with commingled calves or market calves. So the market calves would be those coming from a sale barn. The commingled would be a blend of the market calves and the ranch direct calves. And what they found is calves coming directly from the ranch have greater average daily gain. And the respiratory incidence is much lower for those ranch direct calves. Highest for those calves that all came from a sale barn and intermediate for those commingled calves. Now, some people don't have the facilities or the resources to separate or segregate these animals, but if they do have that opportunity, by not commingling them, you're not going to introduce those different bacteria or those different viruses that cause respiratory disease. Many feedlots will put these calves directly into uh, pen, dirt surface pen, without access to forages, but some 
have the capability of going either to corn stalks, some native range, or some improved mod or modified pastures. Uh, in some previous studies, uh, the difference between pasture and feedlot received calves, those that were on the pasture did have a lower body weight than the feedlot. Uh, the final body weight was slightly lower. And the average day of the gain during that receiving period was lower. But the percent of respiratory pulls was almost cut in half for those animals that were received on pasture versus the feedlot. And again, some might think that uh, because there's lower average day of the gain, lower final body weight, it would make more sense to receive in the feedlot. But you got to think in the pasture, your cost of gain and your yardage and those things won't be factored in. So your actual cost of gain will be reduced for the pasture versus the feedlot. And that helps to limit some of those uh, respiratory or health issues. When receiving on the pasture or in the feedlot, there are several considerations to take into account. If they are weaned calves or falling calves, or if, you know, when they were weaned prior to transportation. Uh, you need facilities to treat those animals uh, if you do have some outbreaks. One thing that uh, a lot of producers are concerned about is coccidiosis on pasture. And if there's not a chance to supplement or to treat the water, that can become a larger issue compared with a feedlot or a pen setting because in those pen settings, you have the ability to feed those animals a coccidiostat or an ionophore. Uh, in, in the pasture, there might not be a good chance to train the animals to eat out of a bunk. If they are naive cattle, they, have, they may have not been able or have ever ate out of a bunk or drink water out of a water tank. And that's where the origin of the cattle may become more important. Uh, this is just a illustration of some simple ways to get a coccidiostat or ionophore to cattle using supplementation on a pasture. There are many different ways that are low cost ways to supplement uh, and it just depends on what resources you have and what type of management system you have. For animals that are in the feedlot, uh, the intake of stressed calves or those high risk calves is very low. So if you can, if you see week one, they're only eating a little over 1% of body weight. And that does increase over time. But this just illustrates that as those animals get accustomed, get settled into their new environment and comfortable with that, and they start consuming the feed, you can expect lower intakes during those first few weeks. And that, that can be alarming to some people, but many times this does happen, and it's up to the bunk creator to determine how much is enough feed for those animals to eat. So to get calves started, uh, bunk breaking, as I mentioned before, can be an important component. A lot of people will take long stem grass hay or any other type of forage or roughage that those calves are used to. Uh, we want a digestible energy source, and we want to be able to provide some natural protein. What I mean by natural protein is that urea or some of those other types of protein won't give the animal the undigestible protein or the UIP that's needed to promote muscle growth. Uh, as I mentioned before, familiar feeds are desirable during this time period. Grass hay uh, byproducts and silages are very energy dense byproducts. Wet corn gluten feed, beet pulp, or wet distiller's grains are high in protein and energy. But if those animals aren't familiar with those types of feed stuff, they might not consume them as readily and you won't get the performance that you're expecting. Uh, pelletive feeds do work very well. They're palatable, uh, they're easy for the animals to consume, but they can be cost prohibitive. 
And as I mentioned before, water intake is very important. If the animals don't know where the water source is, or they're unfamiliar with that type of water source, it can be similar to bunk breaking, where you need, might need to show them where the water is by cleaning the water tank, letting the water overflow for a short period of time, so that the animals know to migrate towards that source. For water, the recommendations are one to two linear inches for each calf. Uh, because of the nature of these calves when they're weaned, they typically walk around the outside of the pen. And if you put the water tank in the middle of the pen, they might not run into it as easy. So if you put it on one of the, if you put the water tank to where they would walk around and walk by it, there's a greater chance of those animals consuming it. Uh, it depends on the height or the age of the calf. In the top right corner, those calves are approximately 250 pounds. So these would be some early wean calves. But you want to make sure that they do have adequate supply to that water or access to that water. Otherwise, dehydration can, can happen very quickly. Uh, a lot of animals that aren't familiar with those automatic devices may take some time to learn how to use those. So that's one thing to consider in your uh, production system. And as always, you know, having a clean, ample supply of water is important for these animals. For bunk accessibility uh, calves, we usually prefer to have 16 to 18 inches of bunk space per head. That way, when you go to feed, all animals have the opportunity to come to the bunk and eat at once. There's always going to be dominant animals in these pens that go to the bunk and they're the, not a boss cow, but a boss calf, and they're going to consume a greater proportion of that feed compared with those other animals. So this isn't a time to limit bunk space. You want to make sure that every, every animal has a chance to get up there and consume the feed. Uh, this picture is not very clear. It's a pretty grainy picture. But my main point to this is that you need to make that environment for the feed bunk something the animals want to go up to. So having holes in your pens, water standing, uh, not a big enough pad, those are some issues to consider in your facilities to make sure that where they're fed is a comfortable place or an inviting place for those animals to go to. Similarly, uh, mud can be an issue. And you can see these animals are close to the bunk. Uh, a lot of times what producers will do is clean those pads off or the cement aprons right behind the bunk so that the animals have a uh, more uh, desirable environment to go up and consume feed. Uh, for feedlots and backgrounding operations, obviously the goal is to increase profitability. We want to make sure those animals eat well, have good gain, good feed efficiencies, uh, lower morbidity or mortality. That ultimately leads to fewer days on feed and a lower cost of gain. So what a lot of people would do is they hear that you want to have an energy and protein dense ration. And so the strategy is always to speed up the process or adapt them to a concentrate diet quickly. So if we look at normal intake and pH curves, time of day is at the bottom of the slide. And there's two days worth. So animals were fed at 8 a.m. through day one, and then fed again at 8 a.m. through day two until the next day. And the yellow line, that would be feed that's disappearing from the bunk. And at the same time, ruminal pH drops as those cattle are consuming feed. Now, the line goes down after the deer or heifer consumes the majority of the feed, and there's no substrate left in the rumen. The ruminal pH goes back up, and then they go through that cycle over and over again. One thing that we don't want to have happen is a more aggressive animal consume too much feed too rapidly where their intake 
goes or their ruminal pH goes down and stays down, even and it doesn't come up even before the next feeding period. And because of that, during the next day, you can see that they were fed at 8 a.m. the next day, and they didn't consume feed again until their ruminal pH made it back up higher to neutral. So one thing that we're trying to do is control acids, acidosis, and intake variation. That's overconsumption leads to lower ruminal pH, cattle back off on their intake, and then they have, when they finally have high ruminal pH, if they overconsume again, they just continue throughout that cycle, and that's one thing that we want to avoid. So this is just a brief illustration of the different grains that are fed. Again, this is how we get a lot of our energy into the animal if you don't have byproducts. But when you look at some of these different grain types, what we don't want is a too a fermentation that's too rapid or digestion or degradation in the room that's too rapid. So wheat's at the top of the list that's the most rapidly degraded, followed by barley, high moisture corn, and so on. So if you are feeding some of these grain sources, knowing the rate of di degradability or digestibility in the room is important, and having too much of this could cause acidosis. When those animals do come into the feedlot or backgrounding operation, what a lot of people will do is they're aggressive early on. Try to fill them up with a high forage diet and not include too much of the concentrate. That can get those animals set up well so that they don't overconsume in, in the later feeding period. Uh, some people do feed the final diet as the only diet and have small increases in the amount that's offered, but I think this is very risky. Similarly, self feeders with high concentrate diets can be very risky and you can run into problems if it's not managed correctly. So if we're talking about bunk management, some of the challenges that the person who decides how much feed to deliver, they need to deliver the correct amount, estimate how much those animals will eat daily. Sometimes if there's feed remaining, how much you have to estimate how much to reduce your batch size or how much you feed that next day. Uh, some observations that the bunk reader does consider is how aggressive are the animals. If you feed and all of them run to the bunk all at once, that's a good sign that they weren't offered enough feed in the previous from the previous day. Uh, the time that they should be fed, uh, you want to have the right feed and the right bunk at the right time. And that's just a general rule of thumb to make sure that those animals are being fed consistently. And finally, you know, if you do need to decrease that feed, you don't want to cut them back too far because then, when, then we can get into that pattern where they overconsume and then back off on feed. This is just an illustration. Days on feed is on the bottom, and the dry matter intake is on the vertical axis. You can see this is over two years and 460 pens of calves that are started. They're started aggressively, and the bunk calls, you can see the intake is increasing rapidly up until they hit the finishing diet. And that's what you want to do is get those animals filled up early. So again, cattle type is important. We want to try to control those erratic intakes so we don't have that overconsumption and that acidosis challenge that I showed earlier. Uh, spoiled feed can be an issue. If they are refusing quite a bit of feed and there's a lot of feed left in the bunk, make sure that it is not spoiled, that it's still palatable, and that will help with your intake. Uh, weather changes can have an impact on the dry matter of the ingredients, so the amount of moisture that's fed, the animals really don't have a requirement for the amount of moisture in the diet. But if it does rain, <coughs> excuse me, if it does rain, there can be challenges with underfeeding the correct amount of dry matter. Uh, weather changes can have an effect on behavior and also cattle type if they're not used to the environment. A 
lot of producers have noted that processing can, if you process those animals, either implant or vaccination, it can de actually decrease intake for one week after implant. So to get calves started, what I can, what I would encourage people to do is have a high quality legumes, but you need to be concerned that there could be some scouring and dehydration. Usually they're started at one to one and a half percent of body body weight, and that really depends on the origin or the background of those cattle, whether it's high meat, moderate, or low risk. Uh, if you have the ability, consider feeding two times a day and also including some rations conditioners. So that would be a different type of byproduct, molasses, or something like that, that doesn't let those different components of the diet fall to the bottom. Uh, a lot of people will use ionophores, but use those with caution. Uh, there are, they are regulated, and feeding the correct amount is important. These ionophores can decrease intake in the first two weeks, and not all of those ionophores are the same. Some are labeled uh, via coccidiostats, while others are not. Usually with feeding an ionophore, you can expect an increase in average daily gain between seven and 10%. And you have a two to three dollar return on those ionophores for every one dollar that you're uh, paying for that ingredient. There are other intake limiters that people use so that cattle don't overconsume in a self-feeding system. But I, I wouldn't rely on those because animals can adapt to that and consume more feed than what you're anticipating. The last thing I want to discuss is six pen management. A lot of times what you have to do is those animals stop eating and you have to start those cattle over. And this is where you go back to those first few days after in the feed yard where you feed long stem grass hay, something to help promote a healthy rumen. And then you might need to readapt them to the grain. So if you remove them from a pen that's being fed a high concentrate diet into a sick pen with a roughage diet, to get them back to that same finishing diet, you need to gradually adapt them to that instead of throwing them back in. Otherwise, you could have some challenges with overconsumption and acidosis. And finally, with sick pens, uh, spoiled feed is used, can be an issue if it's not managed well, because you can't always anticipate how many cow, how many calves are being pulled and put into that sick pen, and how many of those that were in the sick pen yesterday go back home to their home pen that same day. So sick pen management can be just as critical because we can have these uh, very good antibiotics vaccines, but if we don't manage those sick animals correctly, uh, those, they will, will not perform well. So this, this webinar is recorded. Uh, feel free to contact me if you have additional questions. And uh, hopefully this fall everybody has good success with weaning and getting litter cattle 